last little while with all these new JWST spectra is that small planets around low mass stars tend to now be showing up as flat spectra, which are completely consistent with no atmosphere. This is very disappointing, perhaps, but also really important because it's giving us the context in which we need to understand the entire distribution of planet atmospheres. And so maybe it is possible that all these atmospheres are being evaporated and destroyed by their central star. Um, we were, though some of us were at the Extreme Solar Systems meeting in New Zealand a few weeks ago, and it became a running joke through the entire meeting of here is my next flat spectrum, here is my next flat spectrum. It was um, funny and sad altogether, all at the same time. see a secondary atmosphere. That's right. At this time, that's right. right. Which we is don't. the only kind of plausible atmosphere. So I, I think that there was this kind of dream, delusional escape that we're going to magically have atmospheres that don't exist in the solar system, see these big right. features, and we, we haven't seen that. I mean, but people were hopeful. That's true. You're right. So it doesn't have hydrogen atmospheres. It could have secondary atmospheres. And this, I mean, in this particular press release, they do show that you could have a carbon dioxide. Right. And that looks perfectly yeah. good to me. Yeah. So. Sorry. Can I ask, yeah. what's a secondary atmosphere versus a... So the primary atmosphere is the hydrogen-helium dominated yes. atmosphere that start, that the planet forms initially. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, so the Earth potentially had one as yes. well. And okay. then it's blown then out. And then you have a regenerated atmosphere okay. in some sense. way. Thank you. But it's higher mean molecular weight, so it's just yeah. really tiny. So it's really tiny and hard to detect in these yeah. particular spectra. Okay, thank you. The, the Trappist-1 system has seven planets. Out of these, which, I mean, which fraction do we know has no uh, primary? Two that I know of have no, have flat spectra like this, but might still have small. And the others are not clear? The others, I don't, I don't I haven't seen the data on those. I don't know. People here are in the know. I know of two that are public. Out of seven. I don't know if my eyes with the plates, but are there error bars on those points? Yes. So how big are they? Big. They're pretty big. So they're it's consistent big. with the scatter. They're consistent so. with the scatter. Yeah. Okay. They're very thin, but they are there. They're kind of like this big. So are those models actually ruled out, the green and the purple? So according to this paper by Kevin Stevenson et al., the green one is ruled out, the purple one is still possible, but also consistent with a flat line. Thanks. So okay. is the purple one showing the presence of in the atmosphere? No, it's, it, it's, not, it's not showing it, it's just the model. No, I know it's the model, oh. but what, what is causing it to have a shape at all? What? Oh, it's carbon dioxide okay. molecules. So one thing that we're starting to do in my group, uh, this is work led by Laura Amaral, who just joined me from, from Mexico last year. She is modeling the loss of these primordial atmospheres in certain conditions, right? So this is just an example of two, two planets, a two Earth mass planet and a five Earth mass planet with a 0.001 Earth mass hydrogen helium dominated atmosphere around an M M1 star. Now, this is just a snapshot. The parameter space is vast. But I wanted to give you a sense of where we're, where we're going with this, and that if, if we want to understand what is the role of the quiescent evolution over time, and what is the role then of flares, um, how might the atmospheres respond? And the reason why I, as an observer, am also interested in this is because I need to know how hard should we be trying to characterize these stars, right? Like if if Laura's models say that flares aren't actually important, that the quiescent is enough to blow off the whole thing, should we be banging, you know, banging hard with telescopes in order to do the flares? Uh, but it turns out that flares are also important, which we had figured, but didn't really have the models to prove it. Um, and so here you're just showing the solid lines are quiescent and of uh, these two mass planets, and the um, dashed lines are with flares, and you can see that according to her models, that if you include flares, you pretty much destroy your atmosphere, your primordial atmosphere. She's working on secondary atmospheres, that's coming up soon. And sorry, yep. just a question about that. Does that model include the change in the activity of the star over time, or does it assume a constant activity? No, it includes the flare frequency distributions as a function of time, as best as we have them, which is not perfect. Okay. So you assume, so it's going down. So it's going down with age. What distance are we? What's that, sorry? At what distance? It must depend on the distance of the planet from... Oh, it's at the habitable zone. It's an Earth in the habitable zone of an M1. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so that's the quiescent we talked about, that's the flares we talked about, and now we're going to talk about the particles. Um, the particles, the primary particles we're most concerned with is the, from coronal mass ejections because they are the most energetic um, of the solar particles. And so these are huge expulsions of plasma from the sun's corona, tend to be about 10 to the 15, but they range by a couple of orders of magnitude grams per, um, per eruption, and mostly made up of protons and electrons, and they have huge speeds between 250 and 3,000 Kelvin. And here's um, a beautiful movie of a coronal mass ejection taken from three instruments. Um, you've got the EUV image of the sun at the center, and then you have two coronagraphs, um, LASCO C2 and C3 on the SOHO spacecraft. And these are the data that we've now started looking at. So I'm turning into a heliophysicist now. It's really fun and interesting. And so much data, right? It's like so dynamic on all time scales. It's, it's very exciting. And here's a movie I wanted to show you, mostly just for fun, but also to, like, to get a sense of what these planets might be experiencing. This is a movie taken from um, by Parker Solar Probe. This is a spacecraft that is flying close to the sun's corona. And you'll see here, just before I start the movie, I want to point out that you'll see the distance in solar radii as the spacecraft is getting closer and closer to the sun. And it's over a few days. So there's the sun over here. And you can just see, as it gets closer, this is now reaching. If this was the similar situation for M-star planets, you're now starting to probe the habitable zones of these M-star planets. Um, and it's just like a, this is shocking blast of material. Um, and in these few days, the Parker Solar Probe detected no less than five CMEs of direct hits on itself. Now, the sun, overall, um, does emit on average, every other day is CME, depending on the solar cycle. On, f uh, on April 8th, during our total solar eclipse that we got a chance to see, there were six, six CMEs recorded from the sun on Monday, right? Because we're nearing solar max. So that's a lot. I mean, there's a lot going on over there. Uh, okay. Um, another thing that the particles are important for um, is also just to understand the chemistry and dynamics in lower parts of the atmosphere. So even though, right, even though we have the solar extreme UV and X-ray um, up here absorbing high up in the atmosphere, it's these high energy solar protons that are probing deep down. So this is all just to motivate you that we just need to see the full picture. And given all the data that we're getting from exoplanets, understanding their stars better is just the next thing we have to do. So moving on to photons, um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we've been doing for the last a uh, few years. And the photons that we've been observing, here I'm showing you a model of an M dwarf spectrum. This particular one is an M3, so we'd classify this as perhaps a mid M in between the early and the late. And, um, and here you have the red line. These are the famous Phoenix models. For those of you who've been, who might have been using Phoenix models, Phoenix models only predict the photosphere of an M star. They were just never designed to do the uppermost layers, so the chromosphere, the transition region, and the corona. And so we've had to then take it on upon ourselves to build new upper atmosphere models so we can start predicting these environments um, for exoplanets. And so this was PhD thesis work by Sarah Peacock, who's now an NPP at Goddard, and um, she has been putting together all these models based on this. We also have TRAPPIST models, we have GJ436 models, so for those of you who are interested in the full um, spectra of any of these for your own purposes, they exist here at, uh, at Space Telescope is hosting them under the HAZMAT program. Yeah? Do you do this for star by star basis or do you actually have a grid? Should, um, right now it's star by star basis based because these are empirically guided. What we do is we observe in the far UV and the near UV that has emission features, like say we take HST data, and then we fit them to build chromospheres and coronae on top of, of it. So right now it was star by star, but she's working on a grid, and her grid is called Pegasus, I believe. And it's going to be like the Phoenix models, but now with chromospheres and coronae. Does it rely on the Phoenix models? Meaning, can I use that grid and strap and like paint it onto an, an, uh, an Atlas model and it should work? <laughs> Um, well, it includes the photosphere already, okay. so you would just use it all together. Because she re recalculates all the Phoenix models now to be new and improved. So that's going to be the next generation Phoenix models. Um, Do 
we have, do we have any constraints in the EOB, or is that just uh, data free? Um, we have a few constraints from the EUVE, the Extreme Ultraviolet yeah. Explorer, that looked at six M stars. Those are the only constraints we have. And are those just limits, or did we get a were there detections there? Um, no, there's detections. There's detections of, of the classics, AUMIC, ADLEO. There's some, there's some bright lines in there. Um, the challenges and why we don't just have an EUV space telescope is that the ISM absorbs most of the EUV. So we will actually never be able to observe EUV from the vast majority of exoplanets. So, so our strategy has been, let's do the best job we can to predict it, because we're not going to be measuring it. Um, but we can do the FUV in the near UV, and that's what we've been focusing on. So in the interest of time, um, I'm going to just get to the results because I want to have the discussion um, that is a great part of this format. So we have a ton, we've been looking at Galax data, which has left us with a very nice archive of near UV and far UV photometry of the sky. Um, and also we have uh, two large ex um, uh, far UV, near UV HST programs. We've had more than 200 orbits in order to study um, all these stars. And here's kind of the crux, the crux of it, of the evolution of the quiescent Emission. Now, by quiescent, I mean not a flare state. Okay, this is just the regular, um, the star. And here's just the results, putting all these spectral types onto one grid. What I'm showing you here is age. So we have 100 million years here, uh, one giga year here. And this is the UV flux. In this case, I'm just showing you the far UV. We can talk, I can, we can look at these papers for other wavelengths, for, we have a, for X ray, far UV, and near UV, these evolution curves. And essentially what you're seeing, what you might expect, is, is that the late M's stay active for much longer. We kind of already knew that from the X-ray, but now we have it numerically quantified in the far UV and near UV. The early M's and the K stars are pretty close, actually. So the UV flux at the habitable zone is roughly the same. And the sunlight stars here, we actually don't really have this data in the far UV. Um, so much for the sun, but we can calculate this from SDO data. So this is something that we're going to do, but people haven't been interested, really. Um, well, for, well, that's not true. SDO is just giving us the sun today, but we haven't been monitoring sun-like stars at these wavelengths. So I put it as a dashed line of where I expect it to be, and we'll have to get to that someday. Um, let's see. So then that's the quiescent evolution, but there's also the evolution of the flares. And one thing that's been quite amazing is to see all the effort that has gone in lately to look at flares of these low mass stars. Here's just one example from Galax um, where you see an M4, so a mid M, increase by a factor of 9,000 in 200 seconds. Um, and of course, whenever we look at M stars with um, HST, we do find flares, whether you like it or not. So people were also reporting lots of flares in their JWST spectra which they were so frustrated, but shouldn't have been surprised to see <laughs> because it is there. And so here's um, one of our favorites. This is the strongest and more flare detected by HST. Thus far, it's called the Has Flare, came out of our program, where it increased by a couple hundred and 200 seconds. We also have a program that is led by Meredith McGregor, where we observed um, Proxima Centauri, our nearest stellar neighbor and nearest exoplanet host, for 36 hours. And we um, detected a flare that increased, it increased by 14,000 in the far UV. And simultaneously, tests only reported a factor of 10. So the optical flare was a factor of 10. The far UV was a factor of 14,000. So what we have to think about is what is the optical telling us? And how much can we extrapolate from the optical to the higher energies? Yeah. What, for the sun, what's, what's a UV flare? Um, I actually have that plot, but it could be uh, a few percent um, and a, f a, few, a factor of a few, but like so factor two, factor three. 14, yeah, yeah. It's partly a factor of 14,000 because Proxima Centauri's um, quiescence is so low, so it's a relative scale. So in absolute terms, this one, this has flare, is more energy than this flare, but it is in relative terms to a planet that may have evolved around in those conditions would be a you know, smack of some sort. Okay, so the HAZMAT program then is now showing, is able to tell us about the uh, evolution of the flare, of the flares, right? So what is happening, what is the 
flare distribution on young stars and compare it to older stars. Um, so here we have um, the young star flare frequency distribution. These jagged lines are from the data, and this is just a fit to them. Um, the old stars, you can see, are 100 to 1,000 times less frequent or ener less energetic. And the sun, of course, here is totally made up. So, yeah? There should be a cutoff to this at some energy because that's the total amount of energy you have yeah. in the magnetic fields within the... So what is that, 10 to 35 or so? Uh, we don't really know, but we want to measure that. Yeah. We want to measure that. And that's actually what, um, at lunch, we're going to talk about how we're going to do that. Exactly. Measure where this turnoff is, because you're right, you cannot have infinite energy. It's going to turn over. We don't know where. We haven't detected it yet. Yeah. So the distinction between young and old, is it primarily coming from rotation or well, something else? Well, we've measured the ages because these are young moving group members. Yeah. So we know the ages. These 40 million year old stars come from a group called Takhor. And so we know the ages very well of these stars. And the old stars are field stars that we know are not young and are not part of any moving group. Right, but there is a difference in the rotation rates. Oh, yes. Is oh, that absolutely. the reason for the frequency oh. difference? Yes, it is all related to all rotation. Related it's all rotation. related to rotation. You are correct. <laughs> yes, we have in these papers, we have these evolution curves as a function of Rossby number as well. So we can. So magnetic field as well, not just. Yeah. Yeah, like that field rotation. Is it through the convention? Is it one, one to one? Uh, uh, well, we should ask Andrea. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but the field I think also goes down as the yeah. rotation goes down. Yeah, the field, the flare. So the flare rates go down. The flare energies go down. Yeah. The rotation period gets longer. Um, yes, all of that is connected. 100. percent Yeah. It's too bad that uh, there doesn't seem to be any soft X-ray coverage, and the only satellite. I think of that would be relevant is Maxi, Japanese. It's a very wide field of view, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's down to 0.3 kV or so, so it overlap nicely. Um, we should check. You're not familiar with, with it, Maxi. And I, I can, I can okay. kind of find okay. out for you, but it, you know, it's, it's really the only mission that can be, uh, have some chance of following these things. Okay, it'd be great. It'd be great to do simultaneous work. I mean, this is where we're getting a lot of information. I don't have a. I have a plot as a backup if anyone's interested. But even looking at the sun, the simultaneous far UV and X-ray flares are correlated with very surprisingly large scattering. Actually, um, if we're interested in that, I can show it to you. Okay. So just to say that the, my lunchtime talk is about this. I think I, I mentioned that about sparks. Okay. Let's go to talking about particles. What are we doing to understand particles? Well. First of all, we want to learn from the sun, right? Um, because that's the only place we have thus far detected coronal mass ejections. So there's been no conclusive detection of a CME on a star other than our sun. So this is so um, the ways that we are currently trying to do this um, is through coronal dimming, which happens in the sun. So essentially, what that means there, and I'll show you a diagram in a minute, is that when you have a CME, it literally blows a hole in your corona. So your integrated light drops until the corona refills itself. Um, secondly, there's Doppler shifted X-ray and UV emission lines that are detected from CMEs on the sun. And this is um, actually this paper here, Wilson, is Maurice Wilson's paper. Those of you who might know, was a graduate student here as part of his thesis work, was to map the velocity of a CME. Uh, but that has yet to be detected. Um, and then type 2 radio bursts, which is emission that declines in frequency as the CME propagates outwards. And I encourage you to go to Joe Callahan's talk tomorrow, where he has lots of exciting results with respect to radio observations from stars. That's at 11 a.m.? Yes. At the yes, end across the road. Across the road. Okay. okay? And it's going to be uh, very related to this talk, so um, in this regard. So just an example of CME uh, coronal dimming, and the reason why I'm I'm going to focus on this one a little bit just for the slide is because I think it's actually the most promising way we're going to do it for other stars. And so I'd really like us all to understand it better. I need to understand it better. We, haven't, we need to find all the false positives of this. Uh, but here's the example from the sun. Um, you see that there is, here's the baseline. There's a little flare happens during a CME. And then the overall net baseline drops down for quite a while, for hours here. And there's a bunch of papers, there's a bunch of detections from Astrid Voronig and then from our own work led by Park Lloyd, where we have 
potential coronal dimming detections, but we don't have the time baseline to confirm that we're not just catching the tail end of a large flare or see it refill. Okay? So, so these are just candidates, and ultimately uh, we just need long baseline, but we have the technology to do it. That's what makes this one so exciting for me. Um, but another way we're doing it is to lever leverage the connection between CME and flares, because flares, as you saw, um, are things we actually know how to detect. Whether we want to or not, we're detecting them. So let's use that to our advantage. And so one thing important to know is that CMEs do not cause flares on the sun, and flares do not cause CMEs. But they do tend to have a correlation because they're both manifestations of the same phenomenon, which is essentially a twisting up of magnetic field lines, and you have magnetic breaking, and you have mass being blown out, some mass falling down, and so it's a very dynamic environment that um, heliophysicists spend a lot of time trying to understand, you know, at the most, at the smallest spatial uh, scales, which is fascinating. So this is what we're doing: is we're going to then look at the sun, right? Take solar data in X-ray and in far UV, because these these are the two wavelengths that we can readily look for flares in other stars, and start correlating them with CME masses as detected by LASCO. So. Um, just to reiterate, even though we have EUV data for the sun, we're not focusing on that because we're not going to have EUV data for our exoplanet hosts. So we're focusing on this softer X-ray, just speaking of soft X-ray just now, and the far UV, and not so much on the optical because the optical is also not tracing coronal uh, activity. Um, so you can see, oh, oh I just asked the question, but here's, here's the far UV fluxes. You see they're not, in, they're not increasing by very much, just by a few percent with a couple large ones. So the sun is not, does not have huge FUV flares compared to our M stars in a relative sense. Remember, the sun's far UV is much brighter intrinsically than these M stars, so keep that in mind. Um, so this is what we're doing. This is what I'm going to show you now, is the correlation between the flare peak and the CME mass. Here, this is an X-ray. Um, this is work led by uh, Nuri Park, a student in my group back at ASU. Um, and you can see we get a nice correlation. We actually get a correlation. It's built off some previous work, but we now have two cycles. We did it in the x-ray in part uh, to also know, to figure out what we're doing. Like, <laughs> if you can reproduce uh, some of the early results, and at least we were getting the right answers. And so, because it was a learning curve to learn how to use these heliophysics missions. Um, and... <laughs> And, but the scatter is huge. The scatter is really, is really big, but it's giving us something. What it means is that if we have enough flares, we can maybe start making some constraints on an otherwise completely unconstrained parameter space of CMEs. And now we can do it also in the far UV. And so we get a similar result in the far UV. Here, um, again, the scatter is huge. And trying to understand where the scatter is coming from is, um, is unclear in the literature. Everyone is detecting the scatter. Like this is this is real. It's not just giant error bars. Although they do not publish error bars, uh, which is its own thing. But um, but we're getting somewhere. We're getting a handle on all of this. So this is at least for sun-like stars. We can potentially develop, you know, observe far UV flares, apply this kind of correlation to it, and make some sort of estimates of what the mass ejection is of their. Is there really a correlation? There is a significant correlation. Sun, there is no selection effect at low masses that you won't detect. Down here? These are all detected. We've taken out those that are upper limits. Right. Or detected so, uh, It just looks like it's so, such a huge scatter that the flat line would also fit. This is a significant correlation. It is, it's not the strongest correlation, but it's, it's, uh, it's certainly significant enough that it's real. How do you measure the mass in the CME? That's a great question. It sound easy. <laughs> it's not easy. The way LASCO does it is it observes, so you saw the 2D version, right? So it observes the CME in optical light. It adds up all the optical light, and then it does some geometry, geometric correction for the um, observing angle. And so there, there are large error bars. Um, but no, I don't think it explains the whole scatter, the whole scatter here. Um, okay, so what about our beloved M dwarfs? Right, so we're all thinking about this. Um, uh, and so the answer is, this is the only slide I have on it, because, <laughs> <laughs> because
because we don't actually have any information on CMEs from M stars. We know M stars flare, right? So maybe that means there's even more CMEs, but maybe it means, uh, but these, these two, um, these two, oops, where am I going? No, let's go up. These two groups down below um, are arguing otherwise from theoretical arguments. So done here, Julian Alvarado Gomez, you guys might know him, he led these two papers while here at the CFA, where he talks about magnetic confinement of the CME, meaning that you could have such strong flares that you cannot let them, the mass cannot escape. But somehow you still need to get a lot of UV flare energy out. So, so trying to figure that out. And Moira Jardine just talked, this is not published yet, um, but she gave a talk at Extreme Solar Systems giving another reason why um, CMEs might be weak on M stars. And there she talked about for very late M stars, um, because they have no, um, because they're fully convective, they might have less twisted up magnetic field lines on the surface and therefore not have enough magnetic reconnection events and not spew material. I don't know. This is all totally new, uh, new work, new ideas. One thing I like about Julian's work, um, Julian's work is that he um, predicts that we might be able to see enhancement, not in the form of flares, but just overall heating of the corona. So this is something that we can actually go out and test. And so I'm looking forward to doing that. OK, so here's a short list of community needs. I think we're just getting going here. This is something that um, I think more people I'm hoping we'll start thinking about it. What we need is we need some dedicated monitoring to collect X-ray and far UV flares, potentially of sun-like stars, because we are building up these correlations now, uh, but somehow figuring out how to do this with M stars. Um, and if we can do this with spectroscopically, we can also try both the coronal dimming and the Doppler shifting at the same time. And doing things simultaneously would also help confirm that these candidate detections are indeed detections, because they'll be validating each other. Um, I, th I would also love to see dedicated um, sun as a star observations. So right now, most heliophysics missions are not thinking about sun as a star observations. And so using those data and getting them to sun as a star format, so it's usable for our purposes, has been um, a bit challenging. And so I would you know, just kind of think about how we can do that uh, better, maybe the dedicated mission to do that. Um, and we really need more planet atmospheric modeling. We actually just don't have the models yet to tell us how well we need to measure the CMEs, if the CMEs are really so impactful, how, how we're going to compare that to, um, to planet atmospheres. So in part of this effort um, of ours to think about particles, we put together a group um, funded by the Keck Institute for Space Studies um, in order to start thinking kind of more deeply about the theory, the observations, the impact, the um, potential future space missions. Um, this is a group led by myself, Greg Hallinan, uh, Joe Lazio, and Park Lloyd. And it's been great. We um, have a couple of workshops. We're going to end the year off with a report that's going to be kind of a review, but also a uh, recommendations for the future, including some space missions. Um, and then I'm going to talk about very briefly, the two that I'm involved in that I am very interested in getting CME observations from, possibly, um, is UV scope. As, as uh, Pat mentioned, this is a mid-X mission concept that we uh, had submitted in the last round. It was not selected, but it got selectable and highly encouraged to reapply. So we're going to be studying um, exoplanetary atmospheres through transmission spectroscopy and the ultraviolet, but also simultaneously monitoring its star in the far UV and near UV. This is our team here. I'm the PI. And some of these names uh, you might recognize from here. But just overall, because uh, in the sake of, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all the science cases for it. But the capability is going to be a full far UV, near UV, simultaneous spectrum going from Lyman alpha all the way to the optical um, at R of 300 to 6,000. So this is a mission that will be capable of the exoplanet atmosphere characterization, star formation, all these other things. And I'm hoping that we'll learn enough about CMEs that we can include it in the science case. But, um, but hopefully it'll, it'll um, I don't know, we need, we need to learn more, clearly. We need to make some detections before you can really design missions around it, right? Um, but anyway, I'm hoping you can do that. And then the last mission that is 
um, actually funded and uh, due for launch next year that you guys are going to hear about at lunch if you come back at 1230 is called SPARKS, the Star Planet Activity Research CubeSat. Um, in short, for those of you who won't be there at lunch, it is being assembled and tested right now at ASU and we are um, uh, getting ready to uh, sign contracts on launches. So that's a very exciting time for us and you'll get the details on that later. Um, okay. So to conclude, um, I'm just going to throw open this flowchart for us to discuss, right? So we have the idea here is that we have a lot of UV characterization happening of the star. We want to understand the quiescent evolution, the flare evolution, and the coronal mass ejections. So we can do that for the star. And then we can apply that information to planetary models, be it atmospheric models of all variety for a variety of planets, not just habitable zone ones. And then we can compare those with observations in optical and infrared that we're going to be doing from JWST, Hub Worlds, ground-based observatories, and so on. So I'm going to leave this up for our conversation um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. OK, we have about 20 minutes for discussion. Any questions for Virginia? One uh, aspect of m dwarfs is that uh, the radius is roughly proportional to mass. So altogether, the most common ones are a tenth of the solar mass, a tenth of the solar radius, and a hundred times the density, the, the mass density of the sun. So they're very dense relative mm -hmm. to the sun by a factor of 100. And can that explain why they're so active in the UV? Or what, what is the, can you just recap uh, briefly what is the underlying physics for yeah. the, the, the fact that they're so different than the sun? Well, on the sun, right, so we have this radiative zone and, and radiative zone and then the convection zone, right? And we have the tachocline and it twists up our magnetic field and it pops out the surface and so on. Um, the actual dynamo mechanisms <coughs> and M stars, um, well, first of all, it's different. Let's talk about the early M stars that are more sun-like in the sense that they have a convection zone uh, and a radiative zone, and then there's the late type ones. Um, so for the, M, for the early ones, I can imagine it's something very similar, but you have, um, I don't know if anyone else here has been looking at the dynamo theory of M stars. Um, it's still an active w uh, work in progress right now for sure, but the idea I guess is that they are twisting up their fields. They have. They also don't have necessarily fully dipolar fields. If you look at the Zeeman Doppler imaging of these M stars, the latest ones, interestingly enough, do have more stru uh, less structure, more dipoles. And the earlier ones are more clustered. They have more large scale um, complexity. So why exactly that's happening, I don't think we really know. Um, so I mean, my, my view is M dwarfs have torpedoed a lot of our understanding of the magnetic field generation in sun-like stars. They're, the whole theory that we tell people, told people 10 years ago for sun-like stars is the tachocline. So yes. one prediction of that theory is, yes. is if you could finally study stars without a tachocline, that they wouldn't, and lo and behold, there's no difference. They all have strong magnetic fields exactly right. the same as sun-like stars, and, they, and it's just based on rotation. So I think that we have a profound lack of understanding. So, so what, what makes the difference? Well, I'm, I'm asking, I mean, that, I, I don't know, but my view is like, actually we have a very, very facile understanding. Yeah, I don't think that I'm processing these stuff. Yeah. Well understood, but we do know they have kilogauss fields, and that's regardless, you can measure them, right? And it's right. a thousand times stronger more than, than the sun. A thousand times yeah, stronger than the sun. Yeah. Is it because they're more compact? Is it? Well, is it, I, your no, guess no. is yeah. almost as good as mine. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. It's more a phenomenological thing that we know because we see it, we don't know why. Yeah. We also know that the indoors have a huge range of rotation periods, right? Yes. And so they must lose their momentum at some level. So, I mean, whether that's due to flaring or that's just a quiescent thing we're going to loss, we know they do, right? right. So, so but they do it very late. That's the one thing. Yeah, they right. do it much later, so. and it could be due to the inefficiency of the open field lines. Yeah. Right, so if you have a lot of tightly wound lines, you're not shedding your angular momentum, and so you're not breaking. You're not well, it breaking. sounds to me like uh, this theory is flooded with data, but no theorists are working on it, because you're saying there is nobody explaining it. How the, is that possible? The dynamo stuff is really tough, isn't it? Yeah. Christensen, 2009 stuff, yeah, yeah, that's the cutting edge stuff still. In the 2009. 2009. David just said that yeah. everything yeah. changed. 
This was no Cecilia Garathos got some nice papers on modeling this. Yeah, there's people. There's people are working on it. It's just not. It's just not. We don't have the answer. Yeah, but like, what is the qualitative difference between M dwarfs and sunlight stars? What is the just you know, in one word, what is the qualitative difference? I'm not asking for a detailed, you know, one percent model. Well, mass is mass. the fundamental. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mass is the fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't explain. No, I, but oddly, I don't think we have a good theory for the generation of magnetic field of the sun and sun-like stars that holds up to it once you start to change the stellar mass even modestly. Mm -hmm. So, so I think there's a profound problem here. Do M dwarfs have solar <laughs> sorry. cycles? Sorry. One second. Sorry. Yeah, I think. So I want to explain this. Ah, sorry. Thank you. I want to explain this a little bit because I've been also working on this. And for me, the easiest way to understand this, so the theory has been basically saying the um, magnetic field is generated in this Tucker climb, right? Because you have a radiative core and a convective envelope for um, solar type stars. But the lower mass the star is, right, you get to the fully convective regime and then you don't have this Tucker climb anymore. But if you plot the um, activity of stars as a function of rotation, right, you get this activity rotation relation and M dwarfs follow this relation perfectly the same way that solar type stars do so mm -hmm. that's basically where all this confusion is coming from because apparently they generate magnetic fields right but they don't have the tucker climb right so that's the question where this is coming from yeah I hope that cleans it up a little bit yes. 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 Thank Alpha. You. Alpha Omega. Oh, sorry, there's, you had a question for us first? Or? Well, yeah, just are there anything equivalent to solar cycles in M dwarfs? And also, I'd like to compare K dwarfs for a different reason, but if you can answer the first question. The first question um, there has not been a detected solar cycle on M stars. Um, quiescent level levels do change, but we haven't been monitoring for monitoring for very long. I mean, they haven't been so fashionable until, you know, a decade ago. So, um, so I don't think we really know. I would think and Proxima Sen has been monitored for a long time. Is that not true? Not in activity indicators, no. <coughs> um, for for oh, K dwarfs, guess, yeah. is there any, what's the significant difference in magnetic fields between M and K dwarfs? Um, okay, so k dwarfs are interesting in that we thought they'd be this sweet spot, as I called it, um, with a question mark. But it turns out they, um, they are more active at younger ages than we thought they should be if they fall somewhere in between M stars and sun like stars. So um, we're just starting to look at the K stars. We have the evolution of the quiescence. Um, we have some flares that we're working on. They do flare less frequently than the, than the M stars. Um, no solar cycle type cycles have been detected yet, but that's just from a time monitoring challenge. Um, but they are more active than we expected. So that's another thing that might fall into place with this question about dynamo variability and whether it's really about the depth of the convection zone or not, if that's related to it, because M stars have a different rotational history than we expected. It's something that's called the stalling effect. They end up stalling. On, like, so if you imagine that the, if you imagine that the uh, rotation should evolve, so rotation rate, let's say, goes down with time, they actually like kind of stay high, higher than expected, and then start falling. So um, lots, lots more work to be done there. <clears throat> the reason I asked about K dwarfs, they're very special stars. We now have 22 <laughs> dynamically confirmed black hole low mass X-ray binaries. 16 of those 22 are K dwarfs with, uh, between K2 and K4. And that is a, a major puzzle waiting to be understood. It's, it's really incredible. Wow, thanks for that. The data's been there for quite a while, too. Okay, I'll do three minutes. This is probably not you know, directly related to the topic, sure. but you, know, you said something that I found a little bit puzzling. The business about the flares and CMEs, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. how closely are they tied together? Yeah. Fundamentally, they are. I mean, it is magnetic fields popping out and doing something. Mm -hmm. But you know, and you said that you can have flares without CMEs. I can make sense of that in the sense a real big flare can go all the way and have the CME 
and a smaller flare, yeah, it pops up, but doesn't quite eject a lot of mass. But then you said this surprising thing that you can have a CME without a flare. That I can't at all make sense of. What does the sun do then? I mean, um, <laughs> at least no detected flare. There we have. There are measurements of CMEs as recorded by LASCO for which we cannot find an associated flare. How do we? So this goes to the question of how do we associate that? Yeah, that's like yes. This. That's a well, great question. Maybe it was flaring on the other side. It could have been flaring. It could be a total geometry issue, 100%. Um, um, yeah, so it, there, there's a geometry issue because we, when we try to pair them in order to look for these correlations in the first place, uh, we try to get them in the same zone, like in the same angular space on the sun, and temporal space, right? So they are within like four plus minus 40 minutes of each other. And then you have to wonder, I was surprised at why we have to go plus or minus, right? I thought, oh, the flare first and then the CME. Exactly. Yeah, right? that's, what I thought. that's what I thought also. <laughs> um, but then you could have the CME mass flow back on some of the some of the particles are ejected, but some of the particles flow down and then cause a flare. So you could have a CME and then a flare come afterwards. So we had to readjust. But we're following what the solar people are doing and uh, learning from them. Um, so okay, you, here's a crazier thing. Um, of all the CMEs that are recorded, we can only confidently, by this, by this, by this procedure, this recipe, find flares in 10% of them. So 90% of the CMEs we cannot confidently correlate to a flare. Is there a That's correlation how, between CME strength and like if you have a flare or not, or not really? If there's a flare or not? Yeah. Or velocity. Or velocity. We're looking at velocity. That's it. Velocity and acceleration are two things that we need to that we're also looking at. Because um, I'm naively just like, is there a correlation between the amount of stuff and Yeah, the there flare? must be. I mean there must be because the strongest flares spew yeah. the strongest mass. So there must be a point where that you that was this correlation for sure. Yeah. 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 At some point there <laughs> might be flares that have that are really weak, but no CME. This is all things that we can continue analyzing. It's so much data on that. So exciting. And local magnetic field strength. Because all the reservoir is the magnetic reconnection. Event, yes, that's right? the whole thing. So you could, in principle, then look at the um, HMI. Um, this is a uh, one of the channels in SDO. And look at the, mag the localized magnetic field strength that you can then geometrically associate. There's a lot of work that can be done here, for sure. Okay. Hi there, this was great. Um, I have a question. You were showing that very striking plot for Proxima Centauri where you had the 16,000 times mm -hmm. in the far UV. I mean, that surprised me also because Proxima Centauri is pretty old, right? Like it's billions and billions of years old. So is there any idea then, like if you were to scale to a younger M or anything, any ideas on that or would you like to well, speculate? Yeah. <laughs> well, we have, I mean, a younger Proxima Centauri must have been more active with stronger flares. How active that was, I don't know. Yeah. Um, the, co the flare frequency distributions that I showed you, the difference between the young and the old, mm -hmm. are for only early M stars. We don't have the statistics for late M stars, and mm -hmm. Proxima Sen is closer to the late M star range. And all of this is just needing more telescope time, yeah. right? I mean, the Proxima Centauri program that we had with HST that was 36 hours is the longest M dwarf HST has ever stared at. Right? 36 hours, where you, you know, you just get a handful of flares. What you meant, Square? It's also the closest star. It's also the closest star. That's right. It's not like there's a lack in the local neighborhood that you could also look at. So. Say that again? There's not uh, there's quite a few of them. M dwarfs are, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We, we just, just I just need to convince the attack for you. Okay. That's right. Yeah, or build your own spacecraft. We're, 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 I was about to say we're running out of time on Chandra, so we need to uh, make sure we yeah. observe um, lots of them. Or you can argue more of this in order to keep chatting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was super interested also in this uh, difference in kind of like the relative amplitude between flares and the baseline. And I wondered if some of that is kind of almost like square root n kind of counting statistics. And so, and I'm thinking a lot here, but. I'm imagining that something that matters is kind of the relative size of a convective 
cell, like its scale height relative to the size of the star. Mm -hmm. So on the sun, mm -hmm. you're seeing like a ton of convective cells. And on some of these more vigorously convective stars, you might have fewer. And so it's like, I, I'm under the impression that kind of these field structures are like sort of similar in size to a, a set, a convective cell, but maybe that's wrong. And so wondering if you get just like a weird magnetic field structure, but like if there's 10 convective zones that you're seeing, either because it's a very low mass star or a crazy red supergiant like Betelgeuse, then, you know, what each one is doing matters a lot relative. Right. Um, and versus if you're adding together a bunch. So I, I, I didn't know if that were true. For example, you would have a very kind of clear scaling with the properties of the convection. I can't even predict. Well, the size of the these different convection of cell yeah. is not something that I think we have a handle on. Like going to the point of trying to understand <coughs> convection, the role of convection in magnetic field generation, right? Like, I don't really, if someone else in the room has a sense of what a convective cell on an M star or might they be. Big. Huh? They can be big. Yeah. yeah, they're bigger relative to the star. Relative that, so to that, the star. Yeah, exactly. Relative so it's like, like, it's all relative to the star, right? <laughs> it, all, it is all relative. Well, yeah. Another thing that's interesting, though, about the relative quiescence is that the quiescence at these wavelengths is thought to be a micro flaring, a micro heating. It's still magnetically heated. It's still not photosphere. The quiescent level yeah. is not photospheric. It is orders of magnitude above the photosphere. Right. So it's still an activity. 100%. And so yeah. I'm just wondering if you add together a lot of activities, does that make a steadier background versus if you add together mm. fewer, does that make a more stochastic? We know, we know that the activity regions on N dwarfs are small and well distributed. Right. And so, and so that's so. I mean, that's not convection, but that's the no, no, response, no. right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. We also know the lower mass you go, the more st the dipole of the fields, the more stable the fields mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, uh, which is which is also right. unpredictable. Even though so the larger yeah. convection, yeah. so it's yeah. maybe a more stable. And you maintain the field longer. Interesting. Mm -hmm. These are all. These are all. Just Do people ball. correlate <laughs> that with like star spot statistics yeah. and their maps on yeah. stars? Yeah. 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 And how long the what do you learn from that? that? Comparison between like flares. Flares. There is a there is actually a test paper. I can't remember who did it, but there is a paper where someone did the analysis on on um, at least one M star, a mid M, where they looked at spots because tests you get the photospheric yeah, spotting, exactly. and did show a pretty good correlation between the presence of spots and flares. So we know that they're connected, which we know that I mean it's kind of what you might expect because we know it's connected here. The question is. So to your point, Phil, is that we have um, higher filling factors, so more of the surface of M stars is covered by magnetic spots, and therefore maybe that's part of why they, why, but I, what I, the part that I have a disconnect with um, to your question, so I don't have a good answer, is, um, is why the relative strength is so high. I have to think more deeply Yeah, I mean, that. like we, Avi was mentioning the scalings, like the magnetic energy density as a fraction of equipartition is way higher in these yeah. right. m Like if it scales as p squared versus yeah. the density, it's it's huge. It's ten to the four times more. Than exactly. So uh, yeah, it, it, it 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 it's a much larger yeah. fraction of the gravitational energy. Oh, and I mean that points to why it makes these huge amplitude effects. Yeah, that's uh, really also interesting. That is yeah. Yeah. And this just keeps going. Brown balls also have killer gas fields. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So. Okay, a lot to do. <laughs> a lot to do. Exactly. It's a lot to do. Thank you. Yeah, let's thank, thank Johnny again. And again, you can find her around Perkins building if you have more questions. So we have a lunch talk.